I'm Dan Beeston. I'm Greg Wah. We're from Smart Enough to Know Better. And we're this week's guest on Metapod. You're listening to Metapod, where we unpack the web's most interesting podcasts and the stories behind them. Hosted by Wendy Morrill and Kevin May. Is it just me, Kev, or do these two-week gaps between episodes feel like a really long time? <laughs> Indeed, but you know, hey, it's the summer here in the Northern Hemisphere. We're still busy recording new episodes, and most important, we make listeners wait two weeks, then they'll miss us even more. Well, that's a solid theory, I guess. Rather canny of you to mention hemispheres, because this week's guests are just starting their winter down in Australia. That's right. Gregoire and Dan Beeston are the hosts of Smart Enough to Know Better, a podcast in its own world of science, comedy, and ignorance. And sadly, we didn't head down under to speak with them in person, did we, Kev? But we did manage to figure out four different time zones so that we could record it online a few weeks ago. Yeah, so it's a long episode, uh, for good reason, actually, as we cover heaps of sciencey topics and uh, inevitably dive down lots of amusing tangents. Uh, so let's do this and catch up again at the end, Wayne. Wise idea. Please, Mr. May, start the tape. <laughs> Greg, welcome to Metapod. Great to have you on the show. It's good to be here. Thank you guys for inviting us. I'm glad we could figure out all the time zones involved. I just it, it turns out everyone's available most of Saturday. And has and have been every Saturday for the last 15 months, funnily enough. <laughs> yes. It's been it's been a podcast bonanza. You get onto someone and say, Are you gonna be available? And they're like, Yes, I am available. We're, the whole world's available. I'm available, you're available, everyone's available. Stop asking this question. Where else was I going to be except in my room, in my house at this time? Thank you very much. I yeah. So you've been referred to by Wired Magazine as a deranged duo, and your first episode was back in 2010, from what I can tell. So apparently you've been deranged duetting for quite a while now. Why did you start Smart Enough to Know Better, and have you both become more deranged over time? <laughs> mm. Well, we both got onto the podcast train very early. Like, we liked listening to them. I started listening mm -hmm. to a podcast called Geeks On, and I may have gotten great mm -hmm. onto it. Um, and this is this is long before most of all the big names started up. And I loved it so much, I was like, oh, well, I, I have to start a podcast now. That sounds like a brilliant fun, and no one's going to have that idea turns out everyone had that idea uh, but I started doing a podcast called and time where I would get uh, performers from my local impro troupe and we would just discuss impro and the shows that we were doing and it had a very very select audience uh, I think it would get about 35 downloads per episode um, but it gave me like a couple of years of practice of getting audio quality up and learning how to create a show and understanding how much work it is to make a show. Uh, and so then Greg and I uh, were at the same party mm. and we ended up having an argument. But mm. do you remember what the argument was about, Greg? I, I really don't at this time. It's gone so much into legend. I'm not terribly sure. It's, it's going to be something space related or dinosaur related. And I don't remember which one it would be. It's kind of dinosaur related. Ooh. It was about a type of goose from the north of Canada that also lived on the north of Russia. And there were a whole bunch of different populations and every population could procreate with the population next to it. But the population of geese in Canada couldn't procreate with the geese from Russia. And mm. so, and I was explaining how the evolution was taking place across distance rather than across time. And mm. there was a, a lot of miscommunication about that. We had <laughs> had something to drink though. Yes. Yes, and Dan and so I have known each other for a very long time before this, of course, and so we were we were well into our arguing phase of the relationship. You know what? You know when <laughs> when the honeymoon period is over, and and you just find those little things. You still love them very much, but that little thing they do, where they, they click their teeth, and it really gets very upsetting and annoying. And then and you don't want to say anything about it because that would make you a bad person, but it really just grinds your soul down. That's what. And we the were little thing that, that Greg was doing was being bad at science. Oh, just so <laughs> mean. 
Now, Greg was getting quite heated and I was getting quite heated, but everyone else in the room was having an absolute corker of a time. <laughs> and so uh, we, were, we started throwing around the idea of doing a podcast and then I made the website and told Greg that he was doing it. He was like, oh, like, I guess, guess I better make myself available to record that then. I'll only do a couple though. Be a couple. We'll just see how it goes. Ten years later... Here we are talking <laughs> about the podcast. How has the how has the dynamic between the pair of you changed? Because uh, something I said to Wendy uh, before we started recording was that you know clearly the dynamic is great. You bounce off each other really really well. But I I imagine it doesn't start as naturally as that. So how has the you know how has your relationship on air? kind of evolved over the 10 or so years? I think we've become a lot more forgiving with each other and we trust each other <laughs> a lot more. I, my take on it to begin with, we were quite adversarial. Our first podcasts are kind of Dan versus Greg, Greg versus Dan. Okay. <laughs> where, and, and then they turned over time into Greg and Dan versus everyone else, as it should be. <laughs> and so, so we, um, that's my feel on it. That, that's sort of how it's sort of gone. And we just, we learned to work out what we were strong at, what we were weak at. There are some things Dan does much better than I do. There's some things that I feel I do better than Dan. And we've learned to trust when someone says, no, 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 go with me on this strange thing about to do. You just go, okay, cool. I, I trust you now to do that thing. And it's very rarely that one of us has to say, oh, no, that didn't work. Once they've explained it to you, or it's come out, you go, oh, that was actually really cool. That was really different. I wasn't comfortable during it. It was an uncomfortable procedure. But in the end, I see the medical necessity of it. Okay. So an obvious thing to ask then is, Greg, can you tell us what Dan's strengths and weaknesses are and then vice versa? Ooh, Okay. I think Dan has a wonderful and irritating uh, view of facts. So, um, <laughs> I, I, so uh, he he really likes to get into the nitty gritty of it, and he gets right down in the weeds of it in a in a way like a. I'm more of a macro view person, and Dan gets right in there and like gets right down there and has a look at the at the, the, the the all the cogs and the bits, and then extrapolates from there. That's sort of his strength. That's that's my take on Dan's strength. And, and writing things down, I don't write things down. Is that a weakness? Is that a weakness as well? No, well, I, Dan's weakness. Dan's weakness. He doesn't listen to me enough. I think that's a bit of a weakness. <laughs> uh, but, but I think Dan's weakness. Yeah, but is, do I have a weakness, Greg? Does it? Well, oh, he's looking at me. He's giving me the eye. No, I, just didn't, have, I didn't hear what you just said. That's we. <laughs> I tuned out. <laughs> <laughs> very good all right then dan uh greg's strengths and weaknesses then greg's very respectable like he we've we've slowly drifted to this point where he has to play the, the grown-up more often and he has to pull me into line and i and i and i, I love that happening because it means that i can be as naughty as i want and yeah. he can be like the moral core of the podcast and <laughs> go no what you're saying is wrong i go oh yeah it is wrong so we get to kind of get to have our cake and eat it too. Mm, mm. But Greg's real strength, because uh, uh, especially in live scenarios, because he can just talk and talk and talk. <laughs> Whereas when I'm, when I hit a spot where I'm like, oh, hang on, I, I just need to go completely silent for a moment and get my thoughts in order. Greg can just waffle, and it's it, there's no dead air, and that is. <laughs> A skill that it, that sounds like a double-edged compliment, but that is a mm. skill that I just I can't seem to get. I, I'm not sure how I feel about waffle. That's that's not an adjective <laughs> I would have used. I would say elucidate oh, I, on a point forever, maybe. Uh, but but waffle I is have a bit to strong. Edit it. And there we go. <laughs> okay, right. So, and um, how many of the topics that you've covered? And I know you know there's a hundred and nearly two hundred episodes, right? Oh. But just off the mm. top of your head. How many topics have you covered that have actually evolved quite a lot over the time that you've been producing the podcast? For me, we started in the past with me talking about I'm, I'm space sort of background. So mm -hmm. understanding things like the heliopause and all that sort of good stuff. We Because we had no idea. Dan and I were like running in circles with that for a long time. So how that's <laughs> all changed and how so that, that sort of, yeah, that's been a big one for me. It's quite early though, I must admit. Dan, what's your feeling on it? About three or four years in, uh, one of us brought in this article about how about 50% of science turns out to be in some way wrong 
about 10 years in the future. So we're pretty much up to the point where half You've got the a lot of updates coming. Yes, just wrong. We do. Uh, yeah, we constantly, we have the walk of shame on ours. We get listeners to get in contact with us and, and actually tell us, you know, where we're wrong. So some things happen like that. Some things change. And sometimes we do get emails from me, hey, this is incorrect. And you go, when were you listening to that? Was, oh, you mean eight years ago? Well, that's, you know, fair enough. We'll we'll accept that. Oh, I know. No, I know one. I just suddenly clicked. I just realized, see, see that just started the sentence three times. For long enough and yes. suddenly you get to the goal. Boom. Dan, Dan loves dinosaurs. Dan's a dinosaur guy. I bring the space. Dan brings the dinosaur. And Dan's always loved big, scary Jurassic Park-like dinosaurs. And over the 10 years of this podcast, I think paleontology has gone out of its way to point out that actually dinosaurs are fluffy, happy, feathery, wonderful, uh, multicolored creatures. And uh, they basically, they look like they should be in showgirl tunes. They, they t- stop being the monstrous beasts clever girl kind of thing and and just and every time now our listeners get in contact and tell dan how much his monster beasts are now just fluffy wonderful feathery wonder beasts and it's yeah it turns out if you want audience feedback just say how much you hate something and they will go out of their way to (laughs) fill your inbox with every single story about (laughs) Feathery dinosaurs. Changed quite a bit. That brings me to a question. Um, You know, you've developed a relationship with your audience that's, um, I suppose you could, Greg just said it a few minutes ago, it's Greg and Dan versus everyone. (laughs) They can't get enough that they actually pay to be abused on your show. How have you developed this? Yeah, I don't think the word develop really Mm. uh, illuminates what happened there. (laughs) Okay. I made, or no, Greg made a throwaway comment because we're like, there's no way anyone wants to pay that much per episode to our patron. It's like, oh, here's a ridiculous thing. A, a, a throwaway joke. Dan will abuse you. Now, every single episode, I've got to spend time coming up with all sorts of new insults for these people. It sounds and it's like hard work. It's super weird because from very early on, we realized like the biggest change that happens in our podcast is initially we were doing we were making a lot of fun of ignorance and we were mm. making fun of um of uh, magic gems and magic bracelets and stuff that wasn't sciencey and we've become a lot more enthusiastic and mm-hmm. kind about the way that we're approaching our stories now and so now most podcasts are about us trying to find like treating each other very kindly treating the audience m- even more kindly Mm -hmm. Um, and just having a kind outlook on everything. And then for the last two minutes, it's like, oh, this idiot doing this. Oh, this person (laughs) sets the big orphans on fire. It is a very (laughs) odd tail end to the podcast now. When when we did start, there was quite a few skeptic podcasts, and we were kind of one of them. And we and as Dan just said, we weren't. We realized we weren't that interested in beating people up who already had one hand tied behind their back. It just seemed. <laughs> what was the point? And you're not going to change anyone's mind. And we weren't. We had nothing to prove. We didn't want everyone to love us because we hated someone. That just seemed really weird to us. So uh, I mean, I still am not particularly excited by magical thinking and all that sort of stuff. But I don't feel the urge to beat people up on air or to create a platform and then yell at people it just seems stupid to me it's such an echo chamber for the the, you see these youtubers who are like oh this flat earther he's looking in the measurement stuff and you're always just preaching to the choir whereas if if we can get our enthusiasm for just science stuff into the ears of people who may be on the fence in one way Mm -hmm. or the other so that they start having that warm reaction and that positive reaction to science then they're going to have a a more positive reaction to all the science in their life and i feel like that's doing a much better service for humanity your your (laughs) walk of shame segment um i really like a lot and i'm wondering if you ever have a situation where you need to fact check the fact checkers and and some of these are really like lessons in and of themselves um how how are you going through some of those I check every single one because the 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 worst thing that could ever happen is for, is for me to get on and, and go, oh, well, this person said that you were wrong, Greg, only to have, find out that, oh, no, 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 he was right and you should have checked your birth to him. Mm-hmm. I check those things more thoroughly than anything else. Okay. And same here. It's important because it also leads to a conversation. So sometimes you listen yeah. to the podcast 
I would have said something, let's say, and they contact Dan and say that's wrong. So Dan will then say, this is what this person says, but here's, and sometimes they'll say, that's absolutely correct. Great, thank you. And we, we correct it. Or sometimes say, oh, that's kind of correct. And this is what it really is. And sometimes go, well, that's actually wrong. And Greg was correct about that, or Dan was correct about that. So we, once again, we don't make it an attack on the person because they've taken time to write in and, or tweet at us or whatever. We, um, we, we do want to get to the actual core of what the real story is, whatever that is. And what also, are the, the most... message of science is uh, when someone shows you more proof, then that becomes mm. part of the body of knowledge. And you, if you're sitting there going, oh, well, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with that because it's going to make me look stupid. Right. That's not how science works. That's how every, everything else works, but it's not how <laughs> science works. Are there any particularly popular, or I guess you could say unpopular topics that tend to light people up we mm. our listeners don't get in contact with us when they want to yell at us about something i've noticed we don't get a lot of negative feedback which is surprising looking at our body of work <laughs> so <laughs> but uh, we get a lot of positive stuff people saying they like this they like that much more than we ever get saying they dislike this i we've had a couple of emails a couple of communications where people weren't didn't think we'd gone deep enough or thought we had a skewed view on something mm -hmm. but but really i we're lucky enough that people haven't gone out of their way to yell at us at this time uh i don't know why but yeah we just we are just lucky i would like to to go back a little bit though and say that I know there's a point where we've made an actual impact on someone's life by being kind as possible and being interesting. There was a, I won't say who it is because <laughs> they listen to the podcast a lot, but they lived in a very religious region of the world and they were wondering if that was what they wanted to follow. And they had to follow that, that um, religion. And they found our podcast. I don't know how, and they listened to it and they, they've they written to us many, many times now to say that they they love listening to our podcast because it's like a way out of their local physical community and they they can actually find, oh, there are other people like them, but, but we're not yelling at them. You're stupid for having this strange belief about something. And I was really pleased by that. And over the years, we've actually developed a relationship with this person. I never met them, don't know them from, from anyone else, but but I feel like I do. I feel like we're pen pals now, which that's really nice. There's nothing like looking at someone's either their LinkedIn page or their biography and then asking them to explain themselves or go deeper onto something that they've written. So uh, we'll start uh -oh. with you. <laughs> uh, we'll start with you, Greg, on your bio. It says, I strongly believe that the future of our civilization lies in the wedding of rational thinking and creativity. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is, are you hopeful about that? Absolutely. Every day. No, every day. Uh, I, I have bad times. I, I do suffer from a bit of a bit of the grumps, a bit of the Eeyores, a bit of the <laughs> a depression and all that sort of stuff. And that's that's true. But no, I am. I, I love I'm a science communicator at heart. I do it for a living. I, I go out and tell people and everyone. I think we get these echo chambers of negativity on Twitter and Facebook and all the rest, but I get to see what the clever people are doing, what average people think about that. Absolutely. Do I think that humans are doing amazing things? I mean, just yesterday from recording with right now, China just landed a Rover on Mars. How that, did we not just... know about this? No, I did know about it. Nowhere. I, oh. No, I didn't. <laughs> I knew about it. Why didn't Why you didn't know you about it? Tell me then? about this. <laughs> I probably did, Dan. You just don't listen. We're recording this <laughs> on Saturday the 15th of May. We don't actually know when we're going to put this out. So there's a little timestamp for people to sure. refer to. So Dan, one for you then. You say, I find elitism to be ever so slightly more upsetting than hypocrisy. The question is then, is there elitism in the scientific community? There is going to be elitism everywhere, I think. Um, it's, it's human nature to want to, um, to want to big yourself up. Uh, it's a it's a it's such a it's such a crucial part of the way that we interact because how do you get the best mates and access to the good food and all that sort of stuff like there's lots of stuff that we've learned but this stuff's deep seated and I think that a lot of scientists probably do fall down this hole especially the ones who are like ah my job is to find truth in the universe and uh, and look sure yes that's true but um, I think the thing that always keeps me quite grounded is that we evolved to sort of run around on a savanna and so <laughs> our our language is emotive and we're, we've sort of hotwired it to make maths and the scientific method but that's something we have to layer on top of the the initial set of the stuff just because you know the truth and the maths and the facts i mean half those facts are going to be wrong in 10 years 
Mm-hmm. So you know, <laughs> don't you know you're not so clever. Mr. Well, can, I, can I give you can I expand on that? Sorry, no, that's Dan's question. The the um if you look at different generations of scientists in the past, because scientists have to work for money. There's there's tiny amounts of money and there's so much research to get done. And your whole career can be based on whether you can get funding, basically. So you've got to have papers all the time. And it's been really, really hard. So I, I try and cut the older scientists some slack in that way because they you you're born into a horrible environment of having to eat and drink and sleep and therefore you have to do your science but newer generations have access to twitter they have access to facebook that no one uses. it's you know boomer book no one uses that who's young uh things like TikTok, and so all these new scientists amazing new scientists are up and coming are now using this um, decentralized way of getting the information out there and it's so amazing uh that so they don't yes they still don't have the research but also they can just go talk about their science which is just going to open it up and get rid of some of the elitism so uh, rather annoyingly or perhaps impressively you've answered what was going to be my next question which was how is the communication of science changing and i, I guess you know your references to social media have um, kind of mm-hmm. uh, answered that but i suppose another way of uh, thinking about that you know with two teenage kids here and i just wonder and i've read uh, recently that there is you know this generation that's going to be entering the workforce and you know hitting their late teens and 20s and the argument is is that they have instant access to information and they're also short on patience, or at least my two are. <laughs> is that a problem for science in the future? Because there may be a, a requirement for things to just be either explained quicker, proven quicker. In other words, will the speed of science increase as a result of this new generation of impatient, instant information hungry people coming along? This has been argued for such a long time, thousands of years ago. I'm going to say Aristotle, this may go on our walk of shame, <laughs> was complaining about all, like, oh, we're writing things down in books now. We're no longer doing oratory. We're no longer just telling stories that go for four hours. These young people have it all so easy. It's all written down. It'll be so fast and they'll just, they'll, they'll destroy their minds. And we're, we're doing the same. We did it with television. We did it with computers. Now we're doing it with, oh, they'll only, they'll TikTok themselves into an early grave. I think it's fine. I think we're just old. And the older we get, the more confusing and weird everything becomes. And we should just <laughs> let the young people get on and be amazing. Just get out of their way. They're amazing. Get out of their way and let them solve all our problems, which we unfortunately ruined everything. But no, I mean, I like to point out the generation before us ruined it for us and they ruined it for them. It's it's the cycle. And your children will ruin it for their children. It's just what we do. Humans like to wreck stuff. Yeah. I don't have much patience for ballet, but I got patience for the things that I like. People will 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 sit for ages if they're engaged with it. They don't mm-hmm. need, there's not some sort of problem with their brain that they can't just look at one thing for ages. Look at Twitch. People sit there for four <laughs> hours watching someone else play a video game. They, <laughs> kids have got patience. So you have a segment in your show called Your Week in Science, where you discuss something in the news or maybe in your personal life related to science. So I thought maybe we could talk about the... Uh, Mars rover landing and just get your thoughts on that since it happened last night. I've only just found out about this. Okay. I am very excited. I am very, very excited. I mean, the Perseverance, the, the the NASA rover landed a while ago, not that far long ago, a couple of weeks, months ago now. And of course, the Ingenuity, the helicopter is doing its little thing, flying over the planet's surface, doing a five of its runs so far. This The Chinese ship went into, went into orbit a while ago. They've been sitting up there for quite a bit and working out, making sure that everything's fine. It's really, really hard. I mean, you, not many people get to Mars without crashing into it or flying straight past. It's, it's a, it is not a trivial problem just to get into orbit. And now they've put a rover on, on the planet. I think it's amazing. I think uh, I am a human being first. Well, actually, I'm not even that, but I, I like to pretend I'm a human being first and, uh, and, and I don't really care who gets it, whether it's America or China or whatever. I think it's important that we just keep pushing forwards. During the space race in the 50s and 60s, there was always this sort of this narrative of it's Russia against the US, US against Russia. But mm. all of the scientists on the two space programs were secretly sharing information with each other because when it comes down to they're it, they're all Nazis. They're all just Nazis. No, is that... <laughs> that's not that's not true. That's not true. That's true. There were a lot of there were a lot of Nazis in the in the space program, though. I'm just going to point that out. Post World War Two, oh. like you know, ninety percent of the Nazis went to like the Americans got in and grabbed most of the good not good good Nazis. The as good, in good Nazis. Sci- no, the, the good, good science Nazis. Nazis, the good science Nazis, and the Russians got the rest over Nazis, and then they really got into the look. We don't like to talk about it, but mm, yeah, yeah. No, no, we should. We look, probably should. Once you leave the planet, you you become an Earthling. That's what's important. <laughs> 
<laughs> May I ask, the subject of COVID, which is so based on science and understanding what's been going on, I mean, how have you approached that particular topic? Sorry to bring the mood down just a little bit, but I think it's quite an interesting thing. How have you approached it? Because I would imagine some people would like to listen to a podcast to escape from what's been going on from the last 15 months, but it is the omnipresent scientific issue of the, the last couple of years. So how have you tackled that? We were very mindful about that because we do want to be a place of joy and, uh, and yeah. excitement about science. Uh, we did one episode where we, we talked about COVID a lot and then we made, we made a very conscious decision that we weren't going to talk about that mm -hmm. unless maybe it drops in here and there, but we weren't doing any stories about that. It, it was all about being a place where people could sort of get away from that idea for a while. Same thing when uh, when there was some uh, weird political change in the US about mm. four and a half years ago. We, we were like, well, that's, <laughs> that's nothing to do with us. So let's be a place where people can come to talk about really fun stuff. We'd much rather mock a nation, not for its political leaders, but the fact they still use Fahrenheit. What's the deal, America? Fahrenheit, well done ridiculous oh no we're not part of the empire we kicked king george out years ago still going to use imperial temperature measurements well done on that one anyway that's my bugbear the oh, you know, measurements are all arbitrary i, I think you'll find lord kelvin and his temperature scale have, a, have something to say about that but that's fine <laughs> are there any subjects that um are just frankly taboo for you not taboo uh not personally taboo but there are some subjects uh, that I've been a lot more careful with. And then to make sure it's not just two white dudes talking about something, I try and find someone who with lived experience. For example, trans issues. I, I'm very interested in that sort of stuff. And so I, I wasn't going to go, here's what I learned on Wikipedia about trans issues. Because, you know, that's, that's straight, uh, a fast train to cancel town. And so I went and found people who were happy to talk on the podcast about being a trans person in the modern real world and let them talk and let them people talk about stuff. Uh, and that's, that's an area. So if I think it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable or odd or out of the realms of normality, whatever that is, then I'll go try and find someone who can talk about it knowledgeably. And if listeners don't like that, that's okay. There'll be another podcast down the track in like two weeks time. So yeah. That's, Whereas that's I lean into my taboos. Like that's, <laughs> that's half of what, where I get my content. I'm like, oh, this is, this would be hard to get across. How can I do this in sort of a playful way that avoids it being a big, scary topic and it becomes sort of me being a bit dumb and Greg being a bit of a dad and <laughs> us looking at the stuff that turns out not to be too political Yep. Mm. Um, I guess that stuff that we do avoid is the political stuff because mm. the politics of things is not the exciting thing about science. We'll move on to some fun questions now, if we can play with this. I was wondering, in reference to the reminiscence bump, which you referred to in episode 172, related to music mm. Mm. from your youth, mm. I'd like you both to name a band from your youth that you're nostalgic about. They might be giants. They okay. that those guys sing real nasal, and that's me. And that's me saying it. Musically, then they're, they're not traditional singers. And I've started listening to a lot more uh, music that's uh, sort of clear and technically proficient. But they're they're so clever and interesting that uh, it it always brings me joy to go back and listen to some of their really experimental stuff. Okay, great. They're big on science too, aren't they? They had that. Yeah, they, they had Here Comes Science, that whole album called Here Comes whole Science. Album for I, kids. I've actually used in a grade nine science class. The kids weren't that excited. I was very excited that the kids, <laughs> they weren't that excited. For me, uh, I'm not a big music person, never have been. I, I find music, I like music. I, because I sound like a serial killer, because I don't like music. But um, I, I find music is something that happens, not something that I focus on, which is a, a brain thing for me, I think. And when I actually recently, I, I was I heard a band I hadn't heard. I went, oh my goodness! And it brought all these fun memories back uh, when I sort of hung out with goths. Uh, I, I I guess I was goth, but I think goths probably wouldn't have found me very gothy. But I, I wore a lot of black and makeup and things, so it's sort of fun. And so for me, Sisters of Mercy is one of those nostalgic bands. Uh, this Corrosion, that's what I heard. I heard uh, that this Corrosion. And when I realized 
not only was I listening to this song and remembering all these, these 20 year old memories, I realized I could sing the whole thing. This memory, I'd unpack this little hard drive from my brain and it went up, you know, booting up now and it boots up this old <laughs> memory and I could just bring it all up and I could just sing all of this corrosion and I felt very goth. You wouldn't believe how disappointed Wendy and I are that you haven't come along today dressed as in your old goth gear. <laughs> Look, I can, I, I have a jacket in my wardrobe I can go get if you like. But, Greg, uh, next yeah, weekend is to... World Goth Day. I will <gasps> just inform you. Well, the, the, yeah, but your hair though. would need to be black, Greg. That's true. It, it has um, gone a little bit, a little bit peppery. <laughs> Silver so Fox. Silver oh, Fox. thank you very much. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. What famous scientist, uh, we'll start with you, Dan, if we can. So what famous scientist or inventor would you most like to have been and why? Would like to have been? Mm. Oh, that's, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's safe for me to have any of the power that any of those guys have. <laughs> like anyone involved in the Manhattan Project, I should not be let in that room. I will trip over a cable and blow something up. Well, that's because, is that because they're all they're former Nazis, though, isn't it? Oh, that's true. That's true. Uh, although I don't let me hang around no, them either. I'm very we're not saying <laughs> smart enough to know better is definitely not saying that all scientists are Nazis, and we're definitely not saying all scientists back then were Nazis. I'm just saying there were a lot of Nazis in the rocket program. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for the, the clarification I mean, again. Right. I'd love to be involved in like the beginning of computing. Computers just changed everything, and Turing is amazing and Babbage. Uh, and Lovelace, like a, astounding. Mm. These are astounding minds that changed the entire world as we know it. Th that would be really interesting to be around there where computers were like dials and rods and big lamps that went bzzz. Greg. For me, I have always had a soft spot for Tycho Bray. He was a Danish astronomer and he was pre- telescopes so he was sort of before galileo 1609 he just squint right yeah that's what basically he did and he was a rich dude he was a rich danish guy and he uh, his father had actually saved the the king of denmark from falling in an icy river and dying so Tycho was born born into privilege <laughs> like he was his father was like we have all the money and then he was born and he was like hey, even more money and he went you know what i'm gonna do i'm going to cut holes in my roof and I'm going to lie on a couch and I'm going to look at the night sky. And when, when dots, those little dots and stars and planets go past those, those holes in my roof, I'm going to write down the time. So he had this for 40 years, he had all this data of, of, um, of where, what was where. And, and because of that data, this unbelievably precise astronomical data, people like Kepler could start making their three laws. And basically it led to modern science. He also was a dude who went, I'm not going to marry a rich girl. I'm going to marry a peasant girl. Gasp, shock. And so he married a peasant girl not not a commoner i should say which is all very you know i know people talk about it now with with, with what's her name megan and all the rest i can't remember the british royal family but they're like oh he married a commoner like taika brahe was doing it a long time ago calm down and then he was such a, a lusty fellow he wasn't kind of like a boring scientist he right. got into fights and he uh, when he was 20 he got into a fight with the cousin about astrology basically because astronomers and astrologers were the same thing back then and and his cousin went you suck at astrology and Tycho was like i will have your i will i will have you and so they had a broadsword duel and they and Tycho lost it, and he lost it by having his nose cut off. And so it, nose got removed from, from his face. And so for the rest of his life, he had a like a bronze nose for every day. And if you were important, he had a silver nose that glued on. And if you were royalty, he had a gold nose that we had put on. And we didn't know if this was real, but they found they dug up his body kind of recently, and they discovered his noses inside his cow coffin, which is pretty cool. So yeah, I'd be Tycho Brahe because it sounded like he had a he wasn't like a boring scientist. He was a rich dude who was kind of doing science and getting on with the ladies and he was like fighting people with swords he was having a grand old time and then in the end he he um he died because he well they say because he ate too much but really because he just got some sort of bladder infection which wasn't the best way to go but, because it was the know. past it was the, the past <laughs> something something horrible is going to get you look hey hey ladies and gentlemen something's going to get you now i mean, hate to say it but we just don't talk about it you're off to the international space station for six months you may take <gasps> one science book, journal, or magazine, one record album, and one scientist with you. Name them. So I've got a science book. Yeah, yep. or magazine. Uh, probably boom with one exclamation point mm, mm, okay. mm, uh, because mm -hmm. you really want to know how to blow things up. 
in a in confined environment, <laughs> a confined oxygen rich environment. Record album. Uh, the record album. Well, you can choose your format: CD, LP. I was, I was about to say, do you <laughs> even do albums test. anymore? Is, I, is that... Would it? Would a record player actually work in a zero gravity thing? Because the needle's got the, It would just come the off. The needle's got to hang. Yeah. The, ne- the, the needle would sort of. You'd need to get an elastic band a around spring, the needle. A spring would. Yeah, if you had a little spring on it to, to give some tension to it, that would probably work. It would keep it on there without pulling it too much. Then you'd have a equivalent of one G. That'd be fine. But the problem right is in. because it's spinning and the whole like if you you'd have to because it's spinning it would actually change the velocity or the vector of the ship right <laughs> it would Whoa. yes a very little bit yeah a like very, there'd very be a tiny gyroscopic bit. but but it's you're talking about word. a very 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 thin and light record it's not like a unless you're taking like a one ton record here or something weird like that like it's not it's it that's where it's that's where the inertia yeah the answer is it wouldn't not much not a lot. So Over I mean, time, is maybe. it worth it to take? They might be giants with you or not. <laughs> no, <laughs> oh, I sorry. Think, I think I think what I do is I actually have an album which is just three tracks of rainforest noise, and I reckon that'd go down a treat up there. Okay. Um, and uh, and and a scientist to go with me. Right. Someone to hang out with for six months. Who's the Who's the Canadian bloke? Just came back from there. You don't. You mean um, Chris Hadfield? That's the one. Chris oh, Hadfield. No, no Dan, that's who I'm taking. You can't take Chris Hadfield. I'm taking oh. Chris Hadfield. Double I'd take D. Tom Scott then. Tom he's Scott awesome. is a YouTuber and he's like, and he just comes up with these amazing videos. And I reckon he and I would be like besties. Okay. Not very helpful in space, but if Chris Hadfield's going to be up there already, then yeah. That's well, well, we won't be. I'll I, be in one space station. You'll be in the other one. We'll, we might invite you over for tea occasionally. I'm not too sure. I've been Chris a bit and concerned. I have a lot of talking to do. Because Chris is the like the, the old and busted, and there's a brand new guy up there, a French guy. I haven't got his name, but he's very popular in France. He's like the the new the new fun astronaut, and my wife has taken him to referring to him as her astronaut. Oh. And I'm 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 concerned. <laughs> Would this be Thomas Pesqua? That's him. That's uh, him. A, I apologize if I butchered his name. I apologize. So no, no, no. Oh, you he's, he's his very, name. I'm, I'm looking at him. He's very attractive, Dan. You yes, should feel yes. very worried. I am very worried. And he's roughly your age too. And and he's very accomplished. Like he's an engineer and an astronaut. Does he like they might be giants? Look, he doesn't I, I need to. When you look like Dan's, that. Dan's wife could find out. Oh, I, well, well. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's on your short list of items to take with you? So one well, okay. science book or magazine, a record album, and a scientist. Yes. Um, well, we said Chris Hadfield. I'm definitely taking him. Dan can't have him, so that's definitely out of the way. Album wise, album wise. Uh, you said you said was- earlier, Greg, that you, uh, music is not your thing. So rather no. than record. Uh, a luxury item. What would you? A take? luxury item. I I must admit I well if we're, if we're in low Earth orbit if we're still in low Earth orbit then they can still transmit things to me. So I would definitely just I think maybe an iPad's cheating. Maybe that's uh, that's yeah. the big book of everything. That's that's cheating. Okay, you you want like a physical object? Yeah. Uh, I'd take um, a genie's lamp. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's and a then cornucopia. A wish for more wishes. <laughs> you could ironically and, um, take Dark Side of the Moon. Because <laughs> low Earth orbit's nowhere near that. No, no, that, everyone would just go. You just go and pretend you don't understand the difference. Like, um, I, I, I guess a, a thing, a physical thing, like an electric <laughs> toothbrush. That's a luxury well, item for. Yes, but I, I, yeah, I get. Oh, that's very. That is, that's very luxurious. You're, you're living the life there, Kevin. Um, that's. Uh, <laughs> a, you must have beautiful teeth. Uh, <laughs> You haven't seen um, me smile yet. <laughs> I, <laughs> I must. Oh, admit, that's a I bad would, sign then. We haven't been funny. Uh oh. Uh oh. I would. I would want. I know in a space station you have a lot of problems with being alone, and so I would want to create a, a level of uh, by myselfness by having one of those eye eye covers with ear covers as well that that, that give negative noise, so that it can basically. Uh, cancel out the noise cancelling headphones that's what i'm thinking of that's the word i'm thinking of so that would basically make it quiet on there because you're going to constantly have the hum of the machines and everyone like farting and eating and doing other things astronauts do like, you're it's stuck nice in a can. and quiet just out the door though just pop out for a it's, bit it's very quiet <laughs> that's right in fact they say they can't hear you scream i've read on a poster somewhere i'm sure and you'll be screaming a lot okay oh. so some uh multiple choice questions if we can 
Um, some of these are related to science. Some of them are just a little bit silly. But anyway, so um, and we'll do uh, we'll go alternate then. So, Dan, how many bones are there in the human body? Are there 206 or 196? 206. That's well heaps. done. A bat, but <laughs> babies have more. They mm. fuse. Mm hmm. Babies are born with more bones, and as you get older, they fuse together. You end up with fewer bones in your body. Mm -hmm. uh, Greg, what is the study of mushrooms called? Is it shrology or mycology? Mycology, yes. Wow, you two My are good. Mycelium yeah, networks, etc. Et so. Greg used to eat mycoproteins for breakfast. Yes, yes. I, I I don't eat meat, so I had to get my. Uh, it's uh, mushrooms were my way of getting those sort of proteins. It's very exciting. So yes, I, I love the way they're like. We're doing multiple choice questions. We'll get through them faster. Nah. Sorry. <laughs> okay, back to you, Dan. I believe so. In episode one hundred and forty-eight, smart enough to bug motels, you talk about how many humans have been to space. So at the time of recording, was it five hundred and seventy-three or five hundred and sixty-three? I don't know. How am I supposed to know that? I you barely listen to about. Greg. I don't listen to myself. <laughs> Greg, do you I'll know pick the first one. The first one. Uh, the first one is correct. Five hundred. Yeah. Woo! You both yes, sounded yes, yes. surprised about that when you were talking about it. Was that because you expected it to be more or fewer? Uh, fewer. I, I thought there'd be far fewer in space at that point. Yeah, and then you realize... five hundred people. Mm. What would that weigh? Imagine how much that cost to get them up there. It'd be it'd be like twenty five elevators packed full of people. Actually, talking of the cost, I think you came up with a. a, a, a I don't know if it was you, Dan. You said it's per person per kilogram or something like that costs. Is it twenty thousand dollars or something like that? Can you remember? It's somewhere in the in the ballpark of about ten thousand dollars per kilogram to send yeah. up humans, and that's the big thing that that they're trying to bring the cost down. That's why you have like returnable rockets and reusable rockets, I should say, to bring that cost down. So it's you know it doesn't cost hundreds of thousands of millions just to take a human body into space. Because yeah. I was thinking like that's got to be the point where you can afford to send really nice foods up there. Like all the people on the spaceship should be eating like caviar and lobster and gold leaf through stuff. Because <laughs> when it comes down to it, the difference between a really expensive dish and a really cheap dish is negligible compared to the enormous cost of just transporting it up there. Like you gold, get Dan. The, gold can, is very dense. You don't want to have you, gold. Maybe they should be eating nothing but aerogel. It's just leaf. It's gold leaf. It's still dense, Dan. I just send them a real leaf, just a, a normal everyday tree leaf. That will be a lot. That'll have mass a lot less than a gold yeah. leaf. Look, all I'm saying is you can afford to buy the big New Yorker pizza instead of just the value, the tiny value meal pizza. If you're going to pay Ooh. the delivery boy a hundred thousand dollars. So if any administrators from the ISS are listening to this, the one takeaway from this entire interview is send better food to the astronauts and the cosmonauts, right? They eat pretty well. They actually do eat. The idea of them eating sort of rubbishy food that from a from a from a um, a tube, that's all done now. They actually do eat quite quite well nowadays. Uh, it's all packaged and sent up. Like they uh, they send a capsule full of food that lasts for months and months and months. And they yeah, I, astronauts are doing okay. They're, they're not going to starve. They may uh, suffocate. Do you know? Oh, sorry, we're going to go down an astronaut and food rabbit hole here. How do they do? They tend to lose much weight, or how much weight does an astronaut lose when they are, say, on the ice? Almost system? immediately, they lose all mm. of their weight. <laughs> right. well, yes, yes. <laughs> For fear that's, of sounding well, stupid, yes. So that's I, not I, true I, either, Dan. Of course, microgravity. They're not in zero gravity. They're in microgravity because they're they're in orbit around the planet. That doesn't technically mean that the the gravity is gone. It just means that they're falling around the planet. But so you know, it's, it's, we, we, we digress. We're going sideways here. But when uh, they when a, they return to Earth, what has happened to their the weight? If they don't exercise a lot for hours a day, they lose muscle mass very, very quickly. The human body is very good at going, I don't need this anymore. These these floppy things are the, for my bum going downwards. They look great, but I don't need them anymore for holding myself up or for, you know. So I, I, um, I will just get rid of the muscle mass very, very quickly. So they have to exercise all the time. It's very, it's very important. But more terrifying than muscle mass is that your body goes, Oh, this this superstructure we have of, of these calcium carbonate things in our bodies, they're That's ludicrous. That's a lot of energy. That's oh, a lot these, of energy. These bones, let's just let's just get rid of those and pee them out. And so you start peeing lots of calcium out, like lots and lots of calcium, and your bones become all spongy and weird. 
And so when you come back to earth, you're in deep trouble because you have basically, you have the bones of a 70 year old or a 90 year old. You'll basically have to look after your bones and your body. You're gonna turn into a big gelatinous mass and no one, that's not gonna be great on the picture when you land and you're just like a, a carpet with attitude. All right, well, I have much less complicated questions than about the space diet. Um... <laughs> we just you so i'll say you get a choice of two things you just shout out which one you feel like jeff bezos or elon musk Who's this going who to? do i want to murder more <laughs> uh, yeah yeah jeff bezos jeff bezos i want to get close to him <laughs> he's Real a very close. powerful man dan don't make I'm... enemies with the richest man on the planet I, I have a very complicated answer to this. I yeah. used to be in love with Elon Musk in a very big way. It was actually slightly embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, I, this is back before all the information came out and, and, I, and I, I was just like, he was, he was dreamy. He was like this cool um, space guy. And I, yes, and now everyone's listening going, didn't you realize X, Y, and Z? Problematic stuff? Well, no, I didn't realize X, Y, and Z. No one yeah. did until the submarine incident. Well, oh, there was still, there was weird stuff about unions and well before that. But I, maybe, I, you know, when you're in a relationship and you just, and you're still happy together, but the, these little red flags go up and, and that you just don't pick up on those red flags. That's what's happening with me and Elon. And, and I just kept ignoring the red flags. But in the end, like with the submarine stuff and, and naming horrible names to people who are just trying to rescue kids and other things as well just and all the madness was dogecoin and, and I, I realized we had to break i had to make a clean break and so i broke up with elon musk and uh, and now we are separated uh and uh, <laughs> and so and i've gone on with my life and my new crush uh is lynn manuel miranda the person who wrote hamilton i think he is delightful and he hasn't yet broken my heart nor know i exist either way uh but um yeah so i went from elon's so i used to pick elon and i don't think much of jeff bezos either so lin manuel miranda can i can i go for a third one is that fine okay bitcoin or ethereum i do hate rainforests yeah <laughs> Hmm. So it's I'm going to have to go with Bitcoin, which is slightly better at destroying natural mm. habitats than okay. it yeah. is. Yeah. Il 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 the amount of carbon in the atmosphere for, for because of cryptocurrency is absolutely insane. So anyway, Dan and I talked about and argued about this on a podcast kind of recently. Yeah. Did and my yet, weirdly now, we're very much on the same page. We have. Yes. Things have changed. There you go. There's something has changed. Hmm. All right, who will win the celebrity space race to make a film on the International Space Station, USA or Russia? USA. It's got t Tom Cruise. Yeah, he'll get up there. Tom, Tom Cruise, Cruise does anything. He's because he, nuts. He'll just, I mean, let's face it, he's got contacts, you know, outside of Earth. Wink, wink, you know what I'm saying. And so he'll just, he'll just... <laughs> He'll just ask his 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 friends to help him make it, you know, get the camera shots from outside the space station and that sort of stuff that no one else can get. It's going to be amazing. If Tom Cruise goes to mm. space to make a film, which of his films would he recreate? Cocktail or Risky Business are your choices. I oh. like, I mean, you, you've got to call a space movie Risky Business. That's probably the best. Can you imagine yeah. him sliding in, floating in? Da -na 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 -na, and he just floats into shot in his underwear. Yeah. It'd be amazing. Yeah, that, that, see, that shot's going to be better. Whereas you go to Cocktail, what's the major shot that people remember from that film? Throwing up the cocktail shakers. It's never coming back down. They're never coming down. It's, it's the longest movie ever. It's going to wipe out some electrical equipment. That's, and then, then suddenly Tom safe. Cruise is on fire. He's like, he's covered in an alcohol. And then the electrics go off and then he's on fire. And they realize that his skin is actually made from fire retardant asbestos-like material. And that you can see the lizard skin. No, no, that's not. Sorry, I can't say anymore. I'm not allowed to say anymore. Hey. <laughs> Right, we're going to do, uh, just to wrap things up then, uh, we're going to do a quick word association round. Say the first word or sentence that comes into uh -oh. your head. Oh, dear. <laughs> Dan, yeah. this is when we get cancelled forever. I've got Nazi scientists locked and I ready know. to go. I know. <laughs> oh, no. Is it, is it one or the other, or is it both of us at the same time? I just think... shout as loud as you can. Oh, that's, oh, don't say that either. Good Lord. <laughs> right, so uh, the aforementioned Elon Musk. Doge. Stoner. Okay. Jane Goodall. Ape. Yeah, I'd, I'd say chimps. Chimps. You should have said ape because then you'd be aping me. There's oh, like this no, meter no, no, thing. No, 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 no. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Stephen Hawking. My hero. 
You see, I, I hate the first word that jumped in my head because, of course, chair, which is the least interesting thing about Stephen Hawking. His talk box was much more interesting. The technology in that was incredible. Anti-vaxxers. Mistaken. <sighs> well, the thing is, like, yeah. I get where they're coming from because if you, if you vaccinate your kid and there's like a one in a million chance, but then that kid falls sick and dies, then... The, vac- the vaccination that you, you chose to give them is your fault. But if you don't vaccinate them and they get sick and die and there's a much bigger chance of it, then much, much bigger, yeah. you, you didn't do that. You, that. That was God's will or that happened to them, but it's not, you weren't responsible for that. So I get why one position is outweighs the other position in a in an emotional mind and that's what all of our minds are so i do have some sympathy for them but they are they are wrong and it would be great to have the opportunity to change those minds about those for those people it's one of the best technologies humans have ever created the the number of humans that wouldn't be here if it wasn't for vaccines is just we don't even think about it anymore this is the this is the problem nowadays you think you don't get to see people with polio wearing calipers and and you just so so you just go oh it's fine we don't need to get polio but then then your kid ends up with calipers and you go oh it's a problem so uh, we're almost a victim of our of our Mm. medical success we just don't get to see lesions on the body i i feel that if if this disease this this covidy thing that's out there if it had been more visceral, if you if, if it still killed the same number of people, three percent ish uh, fatality rate, I do believe. And but if it was like bleeding from the eyes, and it was such a visual thing, instead of like coughing yourself to death and, and drowning on your own lung, like massive, or which is blew horrific. the back of Gwyneth Paltrow's yes. head off. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Gone. Then I think we'd have visuals, and everyone would be like, Ugh! and we'd all be a lot more terrified because we'd have bleeding eye pictures on the news every night, and so we would get vaccinated. It's the problem is it's not cinematic enough. We need a much more cinematic disease to to convince people. We need better CGI. Well, Gwyneth Paltrow would be okay because she's got her uh, unique candles. Mm. I think that's the most yeah. the most diplomatic way of putting them. Uh, don't take health advice from the first person to die in contagion. That's my advice. <laughs> uh, all right, last one. We are made of star stuff. What Sagan? We are made of star stuff. Oh no, it's Carl Sagan. Oh. <laughs> Carl Sagan. Sagan, not say again. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Sagan. Sorry, it's my it's my terrible Australian <laughs> accent there. Sorry about that, love. In my horrible <laughs> American <laughs> one. <laughs> it's untrue. It's untrue. I just found out about this. A whole bunch of stuff in the universe hasn't necessarily been inside a star. Where was it before then? It's just rock. It's just space stuff. But that's not quite as romantic, is it? I'm sorry for bringing it up. But all the hydrogen in your body would have had to have come from maybe the start of the universe. The universe, when it first came into existence, was mainly hydrogen, a little bit of 2% of roughly helium, a little bit of everything else. So all the hydrogen would be, so all the water in your body is pretty much lots and lots of... uh, I I don't have any helium in my body. I know that much. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, thank you so much for taking us through some very serious science, some Mm, some lighthearted science and um, uh, many laughs. So thank you very much, Gregoire and Dan Beeston, for being our guests this week on Metapod. Really appreciate it. Thank you for putting up for us. Yeah, we have had the best time. I don't know about you, Wendy, but if my science teachers at school were half as engaging as Dan and Greg, then I might be a volcanologist or an astronaut by now. Really? I mean, of course you would be. (laughs) <laughs> well, I exaggerate for effect, obviously, but uh, Smart Enough to Know Better is a perfect illustration, I think, about making science really accessible and fun and also full. That's right. These two are 10 years in, currently on their 176th episode, and they keep coming up with interesting new topics to discuss and, of course, joke about. So our thanks to Greg and Dan for speaking and laughing with us on Metapod. Okay, we'll put a link in with the show notes and some of our recommended episodes from Smart Enough to Know Better. But please check out smartenough.org and dive into the world of Greg and Dan. So it's time to reveal our next episode, Kev. Public service announcement. It's a special edition. Oh yes, indeed it is. 
It's actually something that we've been working on for quite a while and we're now very glad it's now ready to be unleashed. In two weeks' time, we'll be publishing our interview with Todd Cochran, one of the pioneers of the podcasting world who's been there and seen it all from the very beginning. He has some pretty interesting stories to tell about those early days and, of course, the state of podcasting now. Right, so we'll have a preview of that ready very soon. But in the meantime, thanks again to Greg and Dan and you, Wendy, and most important, thanks to all for you for tuning in. We'll see you next time. That's it for Metapod this time. Thanks for listening. Metapod will be back soon with another unpacking of the web's most interesting podcasts. But in the meantime, make sure to subscribe at any of the usual places you find your other favourite podcasts. We'd hate for you to miss upcoming episodes, and we'd love it if you left us a review. You can let us know what you think of this episode by going to metapodshow.com. We'll see you next time. Metapod is produced by Wendy Morrill and Kevin May.